So I just updated the schedule and got us a, um, a project specs for sorting. So I'd like to uh, start by reviewing the schedule um, and then we'll get uh, updates to see where everybody is. Um, and then I think it might be useful for us to start um, pseudo coding or, or thinking about uh, the algorithm for uh, bubble sort if we haven't already. And then we're going to start uh, we're going to start into git or git as I like to say. Um, so I think that'll probably take us through the the week. Any burning questions that we need to address as a class before we jump in? Okay, um, glad to have everyone back. It's fun to have such a big class. Okay, so let's sh show you what I got. Got such a big class that I, I'm tempted to try to say hello to everybody, but I realize that's probably tedious. Um, so general general hellos to friends and, and people I don't know very well yet as well. So here we are. Um, again, F5 is your friend, so uh, refresh if you haven't already. Um, on our schedule, we are down here on week uh, seven. So um, I did did a bunch of column uh, column spans here. So actually, let me swap those to Oh no, chopped it off. Hold on. Don't chop. So this first link is new. Just built this a second ago. Um, I tried to come up with specs. I should have had this last week, but sometimes things just don't always go as quickly as we want. Um, but now we've got a, a page on which we can centralize our project steps instead of me scrambling to stick it in the schedule table. So remember, this is our, uh, our visualization of sorting. So we are trying to endeavor to sort our custom objects based on one of the member variables that is in there. So we reviewed building accessor methods and so forth. And so this follows the, the same structure as I did the uh, team builder. I've got our objective and then the required organ. So we're, we're all well on our way with our custom class. Today I want to think about our sorting tool class. So this is where your actual sort method will live is in uh, your sorting class and then a test environment, which in our case we called uh, shopwater.cpp. And so um, you'll, you'll be sitting in a, a three class environment at least uh, when, we're, when we're through with this. And so the interface, we want to be really simple. The key thing that we want is to be able to see the vector of your custom objects before the sort. And then we want the user to be able to say, ready, set, sort, and then see the output. Um, users should be able to trigger the sort with a simple output. And then um, what I should have is a third item there saying, um, and we need to be able to see what comes out. So let me add that here. So, um, and display a list of display the same vector. Remember, we're going to be operating on the same underlying object. Display the same vector with the items sorted. So now we've got that there. As normal with documentation, uh, we want to comment things that should be commented. And uh, I don't want you to turn your brains to mush. So please be uh, careful with what kind of outside resources you use such that you're doing the hard work. I remember I'm teaching you to build the tools 
that other people use as as coders you're building tools for organizations and and folks to use and so you knowing how those work is the most important i have no doubt that you could search around and scramble up some code from the internet and 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 uh, cobble something together but then your brain would be mush and that's not good um so let's get a, a quick uh check up on where people are so i put the work tracker in here as well it's a uh, linked in all manner of places now. So you can get at it there and you can also get at it from our homepage. It's the one that says master repo and work tracking spreadsheet right there. So we are down here on object sorting and I'm gonna scoot that over so it's the leftmost tab. And let's get a um, we had our September 23rd status, so let's do a, um, let's check and see, I'm going to actually lock these cells, I'm going to protect that range, um, 23 SEP update, so only me, and then We'll make this one today. I don't want you overflowing. Chop you off. Okay, and then so this is 28 sup status. So um, what we want to know is do you have a working uh, custom object? And have you tinkered? with a sort uh, sort foo method function ah, C++ plus um, plus so let's do that so you're gonna have a okay, let me lock the columns view freeze freeze one row and view freeze one column. Okay, good. So now we can scroll over and see how people are doing. So we want a two part, two part update. Um, and by working, we mean uh, IE tested. Um, you have a working custom object Let's do this and sorry, I'm adjusting it as we go. You have a working custom object. Uh, and then B is have you made an unsorted vector of your object? So remember, we ended last time with me making a bunch of tanks um, in a for loop. And so that's what we want. So in my case, Oh no, we want to freeze two columns. Freeze two columns. There we go. Okay, so Loretta has been working uh, not as hard as she might. Um, so we, so yes, I have a tank object with uh, private members and accessors. And then if you want to add a Another row in a spreadsheet, you do control enter. Um, and yes, I have, I made a set of 30 tanks with um, different uh, value, different um, member variable values. And um, no, I don't have a sorter function but I walk around thinking about bubbles um, I told you the story of going to grad school and finding it really interesting to see a lot of computer programmer types that would just kind of they would walk with a very deliberate kind of thoughtful thoughtful walk so if you, if you get stuck on your project go out to your street wear a mask and and do a little like little, little you could be like a little bubble 
uh, as you walk around the street and someone say, what are you doing? And you're saying, I'm, I'm thinking about sorting like a bubble and how things bubble up to the top. Because remember, the exciting thing about a bubble sort is we can organize a great big complicated thing by only evaluating two objects at a time, which is a very simple thing to do. And so part of the goal of this class is for me not to tell you uh, what you're, how to do the code, but to provide a container in which you can start solving problems by solving successively more complicated problems. So if I slow this down, um, that's the exciting thing is the, oh, that's nice and slow, is remember how our pseudocode algorithm says set, you've got, you're only dealing with two objects at a time and your only two outcomes are swap or don't swap. And then you move your, your pointers down uh, one object. And so um, the algorithm bug, I'm hoping you'll catch the algorithm bug from this class to realize that um, some of the most complicated things computers have been programmed to do, machine learning and think about self-driving cars. Think about how many sensors and how many different decisions a machine is trying to make at the same time. Well, each one of those can be broken down to uh, very simple checks. Uh, check, check my left sensor. Do I sense an object? Yes or no? Yes. How far is the object? Record that value. Is that object too close within thresholds? Yes. Do not let car back up any further. So we want to start thinking of those algorithms um, as successively smaller and smaller problems to solve. Um, so there's bubble sort. Let me, how's the updates going? Because I've been kind of blabbing a little bit. Um, good. Catching up is fine. Um, it seems like so almost everyone is still on the vector project. Um, and a, a quick note, let's see how we're doing our schedule. Um, we're getting our updates. Uh, and then you might even uh, think about if your brain is feeling overwhelmed, take the larger problem of sorting. So big, your big problem is uh, custom object sorting. Uh, this is complicated. This is more complicated because not only do we have to think about the bubble sort, but we have to think about how do my, how am I interacting with my custom object. So remember, if you, uh, I like the idea of a coin. So um, if we have a coin class and it has uh, maybe one of the variables is cent value and another one is mint year, that's nice because there's only two options and they're both quantitative. So we've got a bunch of, bunch of coin objects and we put them in a vector. Um, we are trying to solve those two problems at the same time, both the sort and our custom object. So how can we reduce this down to a smaller problem uh, to solve? But well, one way that we did that was we started by making your object model without thinking about how they're sorted. Um, and so we separated that out. How can we break down the sort problem into something smaller if, if, uh, if your brain needs a more of a nugget size thing? Instead of sorting objects, what could we try sorting? Fancy objects, I should say. You could try sorting integers if you're trying to, like, just think about sorting. Is that what you're getting at? What could we put in the vector instead of coin that makes something simpler? Um, can I do a mic check? I feel like someone's probably saying something and I'm not hearing it. Mic check, mic check. If your name is Mike, please stand uh, up. <laughs> 
because I haven't heard anything from anybody yet. Uh, Isabella, could you mic check? I see you're off mute. Hello, hello. Can okay, you hear me? I'm not getting audio yet. Hold on. Mic check, mic check. Can um, you hear me now? Speaker. No, no, no. Speaker is mono. Mic is mono. This should be... This is Peter. Ah, good. Mic check again? Mic check, mic check. If ah, your name is Mike, please perfect. stand up. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. I apologize if I was giving you this look. and You're all thinking, wow, this is not working very well. So let me ask that again. Uh, instead of having uh, sorting coins, what could you do that's simpler? Uh, cups. You said cups? Yeah. Like, like integers? Are you are you looking for that type of simple? Yeah, something something that doesn't involve complicated object access. Yeah, use integers. Yeah, so start with something smaller, uh, like a vector of ints, where you have built-in compatibility with uh, mathematical operations and comparisons. So simplifying down here uh, is really great because you can certainly get help with vectors of integers if you need to look up in the book where that's often an easy place to start. And so what might be useful uh, is that maybe we spend a little bit of time uh, thinking about how we might sort a vector of integers. And then you can take the next step on your own of trying to figure out how to sort uh, your custom object. And this design process of uh, being potentially overwhelmed with something complicated and figuring out how to reduce it down um, to tiny, uh, to a tinier problem is really uh, the magic. And I'll have a clip for you on Wednesday of Matt Damon talking about just this. So that was just fun. I got got behind on my audio video. So um, schedule-wise, what I'm going to invite us to do is try to have. What I'm thinking of is maybe is Monday a reasonable. Um, next Monday as a kind of a, a chance to move on to another uh, iteration. So that gives you a week to um, to work on it. I think that should be good. Okay, we got one upvote. Any, any down votes? That sounds pretty good, honestly. Okay, um, and keep, keep me posted on this. It's always a it's always a uh, back and forth. I don't want to drag, but I also don't want things to be too pressured. Um, okay. And the sort? Yes, the, the, this sorting project that I now have a specification for. Does Monday seem reasonable? Yeah, that works. The A, B, and C? Yes, for, for those. Um, well, A, B, and C is just the update for today. But yes, A, B, and C encapsulates the, the whole arc. Okay. Um, all right. So let's check our time. I want to give us a half hour at the end for uh, wading maybe knee depth into into Git. What do I do with my watch? Well, when I'm done, ask the computer what time. Okay, 48. So let's do a half hour of tinkering with bubble sort, and then we'll do a half hour with, uh, with Git. Um, let's also set, see where you are on, um, on Git. Did we, I think we were adding, um, did, I, did I ask you to post Git somewhere yet, or did we not get there? We did not get there. Okay, good. So we'll, we'll, when we get to our Git part of today, we'll, uh, I'll make us a, a place for that. Um, I think when we did the vote, I think only three or four of you had done uh, much Git. So let's, let's reframe our project, our sorting algorithm as the smaller bits. So we're sorting uh, vectors. So how would we think about uh, bubble sort uh, of plain ints. Um, I'll be right back. I've got music going in the other room. So bubbles start with ints. Our basic principle 
is if we build, let's make ourselves a vector this way. Grab your paper. Remember, this is uh, this is a paper class. We want we want you scribbling and jotting notes around and all sorts of things. Um, so let's get some let's get some int. I want something with a lot of numbers. Where's my uh, stats book? Okay, so I'm gonna just get some random ints from this from this index of uh, pages. So six six thirty five seven three seventy four fifty five one thirty. Uh, one, nine, three. Uh, so make yourself a set of random ints, and then let's, uh, when I think about putting together a mini project, what are, what are the, what kind of things would I want to sketch out and include in my, in my planning? So here's our uh, sort pseudocode once again, but this time being a little bit more specific to our vector. So those are our indexes. We've got seven items. Um, so my first step is to um, set up my variables. So what kinds of uh, values am I going to need to keep track of through this sorting process? Um, and let's remember our, at the highest level, we are only comparing two things at a time. So maybe what would be neat is let me grab my uh, note cards. Excuse me. So we could use note cards. I'm going to put note cards up here because I can move them around. Um, and they'll represent our variables. So remember, the bubble sort is based on comparing two values side by side. So at minimum, I'm going to need to keep track of what my first value is and what my second value is that I'm comparing. Um, and so I could do, maybe I'll name one variable. Um, Val first, and another variable, Val second, and I can, these are going to be uh, int type because they're going to have the uh, index of which part in my simple vector of integers I'm looking at. So this is kind of cool. So we can imagine what I'm going to need to do in my loop is have my val first and val second get loaded up with the first two items in my array. And then what do I do again? I ask what? I asked the computer to tell me what. If one is bigger than the other. Yeah, and so um, I can, when I'm doing the planning, I'm not going to get too worried about efficiency first. So I'm just going to think that's something that I'm going to need to keep track of. I want to know if they're out of order, meaning uh, I will we'll start with ascending order. So our goal will be, um, sort ascending and so with that as our criteria 
I could have a Boolean type, a Boolean variable, Boolean type variable that tells me whether or not I need to undertake a swap. So I'm going to have, I'm going to make my yellow cards are going to be Boolean. So maybe I'll name it so that its value is obvious. So in my mind, I like a true value to indicate that I need to do something. So maybe my Boolean will be um, uh, out of, uh, yeah, out of order, out of order. Um, and so I could imagine, so this one could be either, we're going to get crafty here. If you've been in my classes, Marilyn knows you can get crafty quite quickly, um, in data at least. So this could be either true or yeah. false. And you you um, contributed major craftiness. I think we still have it in there. So this can be true or false. And so if I'm sketching this out, I would say, OK, I'm going to position my, my value um, markers in the right spot and then I'm going to ask um, I'll, I can make a note like evaluate for orderedness so and this would be simple of so my pseudocode could be something like um, if while first is greater than val second, then I'm going to set out of order to be true. Else Uh, out of assign true to out of order. Else out of order, out, that's cool, equals false. Okay, so I've got those things I'm going to track. Um, and now I can start. I can use my little marker variable to decide, under the condition that this is true, I will need to trigger the operation, and that operation is swap. So again, I'm I'm not worried about efficiency yet. I'm trying to be as linear as I can with my thinking. Um, so then I can track this guy and say if. In this case, because it's Boolean, I can use it to control my if. So I can say, if out of order, because this is true or false, if out of order, I could call a method, a function like um, do swap. And what are the things, what's do swap, what are the only things that do swap needs? Do swap will need to know. Position. Yeah, where, where I am in my sequencing. So uh, probably the, the non-efficiency minded way of thinking about this would be uh, I'll pass in both the value first and value second. But in reality, because I know that value second is always one index greater than value first, in theory, I would only need to tell do swap kind of where my first pointer is, and it will know to swap it with the second position. So you can, part of the design process is figuring out what the right, how to link these functions together. That's step two, but I want to get my flow working first. So I'll say do swap, and for clarity's sake, I'm going to send in val first, val second. 
and if I were doing object oriented design and I wanted to be able to sort any vector, I'd also pass in my uh, maybe numvec. So why don't we name, why don't we give our vector its own variable. So we'll call this um, vector of ints called numvec. Okay, so I can pass in numvec. And so if that gets triggered, then I'm going to jump over to my do swap. And so here's my. Have my three inputs. Uh, and so I can, I will, um, so think about now we can, now we're doing the same thing we did before, but even on a smaller level of how do I swap two values in a vector? So if we think about what am I going to need to remember um, without, we don't want to overwrite a value without having stored it first. So... Hey. Take yeah. seven, put it into a temporary integer, put yep. six, 65 or 600, whatever, into where seven was, and then put seven into where 600 was. Yeah, so that was Ryan, right? Yes. Yep, so I think at minimum, uh, you'll need to have a temporary place to store one of your two values. So over here, I might make another variable called um, uh, maybe temp int. Um, that way, I won't lose it. So we could, to that point, if we wanted to write our pseudocode, um, uh, store second uh, item temporarily, then move first, uh, we could say write first into second, and then step three is write temp to first. Hey, that's pretty cool. See how we can start taking a complicated thing and turn it into small things that are that are less overwhelming. Um, okay, so I like I see people writing and thinking that's great. Um, we're getting making some progress here now. So I'm imagining this working. So I'm going to use a different color to track a test because I we don't quite have all the variables we need yet because sick I know already looking at my list that remember I may go through this once and implement the algorithm I have and my list may have will not may not necessarily be sorted we have to assume that it's not we have to assume that what's the worst case scenario of input the worst case scenario input is what? If we're trying to sort ascending. It's sorted by descending. Yeah, the worst is the biggest numbers are at the top and the smallest are at the bottom. So everything will need to get completely inverted. Um, and the next phase of our class is to then start asking these efficiency questions of how many different operations will it take to accomplish our algorithm uh, given certain inputs, best case inputs, worst case inputs. So the bubble sort best case is, who, who answered that? Was that um, Ben? Misha. Misha, yeah. So best case then, it's not Misha, would be what? As in best case for 
it would just be ascending, so it's already sorted by yeah, chance. I think Sarah was saying it, but it was muted. Um, yeah, so at minimum, I will have to verify by scooting down my array that, in fact, each pair is properly ordered. So this is getting to think, well, what, what's going to be another thing that I'm going to need to track as I go down? The number of times you run through the list and the number of times you make changes to the list. That would certainly be interesting, but maybe not necessary. But it's in that order of, so I guess number of times it would be, uh, what's the goal of recording that? The goal for number of swaps would be like, to like after it runs through the list, check if if the number of swaps hasn't changed, then you've still sorted the list. But like otherwise, I guess for information's sake. Yep. Now, who can build on what Ryan just said? He said, "If number of swaps hasn't changed, I think something more accurate would be if we're tracking how many swaps, we would go back and start it again. If what?" How many swaps would we need to do to know that we'd have to go back and check? One. One, yeah. So if we do any swaps on a pass, that means we're not sorted yet. So the only time we're going to stop doing this is when my little checker, little checker buggers can go all the way down and never find an out of order pair. So I definitely, um, I'll definitely want some sort of, maybe this would make sense for an int then, um, to call it num swaps, num swaps in pass. So we might say, okay, good. We're building this out. So then so what am I going to need to do here this is cool so now that I know that I need this variable if I have an out of order pair I'm going to do my swap and do what add one to number of swaps yep so I can do num <laughs> swaps in pass plus, plus. plus yeah who was that Peter. Oh. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do that. So it's gonna play on <laughs> And now now it's okay, okay. here, which is I like tradition. I wonder what language that is. Um, what am I going to have to wrap all of this in then? A large method inside the sorter class or something? Definitely. Um, but that wasn't what I was thinking. So Ryan, you'd be like a do while. Or loop? <laughs> yeah. Uh, put it in a loop. Um, and a four is a good option. If I've got this sitting around, I might be able to easily use a, a while loop and say while num swaps in pass is not zero, do it again. Um, so let's see if we can put this all in a loop. I'm going to rearrange my board a little bit. So I'm going to do this before my loop. So set up, so step zero is set up variables. Um, in our case, it might be make, uh, make array or make vector. 
two sort. And then I could see something like just a big while. While num swaps and pass is greater than zero. You mean? You mean? You mean? Do this. Yeah. Um, what am I going to need to remember to do? Uh, when am I going to reset this? After the I want this to, order to exit. Order. To Say it again. After it, iterate, after it iterates the whole list. So here? Uh, yes. Anyone agree or disagree with Ryan? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put I'm going to put operations on a on a white card. So reset. So I feel like they threw out fire. And look at the judge. If we do it here, if I go chug, 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 and I have to do all the swaps, and this is at five, and I reset this to zero, I come back up, I will only make one pass. So I disagree. Other nominations. I don't want to do it at the end because I need my while loop to look at it right after I get to the end. You could do it right at the beginning after the while loop starts. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. So once we've used it to trigger our next while loop and before I do our first evaluation, that's when I'm going to reset it. And so then I can check it, go through, do my swaps, come back up. If this has not reached zero, do it again. Hey, that's, that's, this is a workable thing. Can we just use a bool instead of end? Cause is there any, reason to have it go more than one swap because if there's at least one we know we have to uh loop it again so it doesn't really matter if uh it's like two three four would it be more efficient to just use a bool or not necessarily um i think a bool would certainly work um from a from an interest standpoint it might be uh kind of fun to be able to see how the number of swaps progresses given a certain ordering, um, but both would accomplish it. So uh, Misha's suggestion of this could be, uh, how would you rename it? It might be something like, well, unsorted equals true. Yep, still unsorted equals true, or maybe uh, pertaining more to what the variable is used for, something like swap, swap made during pass um, so we could uh, we could do that as well um, so this could also be a boolean I'm going to keep it as an int um, for now in fact so once we've got this high level code you can start seeing we could probably eliminate this if we wanted to depending on how if we needed to do any intermediate work because ultimately if value first is greater than value second maybe I could just call do swap right here and maybe I wouldn't need that um, 
this is the kind of stuff I want you to start trying to tinker with and to see how that how that works. Questions so far? This is neat stuff. I have a question. Um, if let's say, do, will the bubble sort sort um, two different things? Like let's say I'm doing paint. So let's say I want to find out if my paint is going to be, I want the ones on top to be the cheapest at the highest quality. So it can sort the both and kind of woo -woo down the list. <laughs> uh, absolutely, and the more complicated world. So we got, um, no, we got off the easy version. because there's a natural ordering inherent in the int. And so because to the C++, plus uh, plus plus, there's not a natural order inherent in paint, this comparison, this is your major point of evaluation and this is where object oriented design is clever because instead of using a built in operator of greater than if you build in a comparison function on your paint can then this might become let me uh, so let's think about that with Sarah's question so um, instead so maybe for your custom type You might have something like uh, uh, paint can uh, one dot in Java. It's called compare to, which is the the built-in comparator um, interface in Java. So we might say something like paint can one dot compare and we write the compare method to accept another paint can so we could pass in paint can two and then this whole thing uh, and then compare would return a boolean which you could then use in there so this would be spit out true or false and then inside compares where you build in all of your logic for which uh, which values which member values in your paint can are you actually going to use for the comparison and you could try to figure out um, what's the how do you combine cost and quality to determine an ordering just considering two paint cans so that's that's kind of neat so in general um, does anyone know it's compare will not actually return true or false if we're using built-in sorters? Anyone know what they generally return? I'm something for my cat while you think. Isn't it like zero and one? Zero, one, and? And negative one. So what's uh, most useful in our custom sorting is uh, to be able to say greater than, less than, or equal to. Um, so this would be zero, one, or minus one. So this would be equal, less than, and one would be greater than. Oh, that's, the light is killing it. Which light is killing that? That's better, good. Um, so good questions, good thinking here. All right, we are, uh, this gives you some stuff to chew on, I hope. Um, so, and again, start simple, try doing this in, you can do it in a main and just start tinkering. Uh, and then break off into a function. So your you could use your vector as just a, a global variable for starters, like we did with our uh, first project with the group, the team optimizer. 
and then you can start getting more complicated uh, as you find your sea legs, uh, as they say, on the open waters. I had to, I was doing roofing this last couple of weekends and it took me like three weeks to get my roofing feedback. It's, it's amazing how much trick your, 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 your brain, how many tricks your brain plays on you. If the slope is the same along a 30 foot roof line, I'm perfectly happy standing here without any protection. And if I climb up 20 feet, even though the slope is exactly the same, I go, Oh, Oh, and I grab for my <laughs> ropes. So remember, give your, be easy on yourself and do stuff that you know how to do first and don't get overwhelmed by things that you don't know how to do yet uh, and build out from there. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to do what would be helpful. What if I do a quick screenshot of this so we don't lose it? I've not figured out how to do this well. Hold on, I'm still here. You can see the Gotta top do of my a duck down move. I'm in, yeah, my little don't don't <laughs> put my head in the in, in the capture. Hold on. Stand by. Uh holding. Holding. <laughs> here you get the top of my, my head. Then you know that I, I it was my screenshot. Okay. And then I'm gonna we're gonna post this because this is me. I realize that I don't get. Oh damn it! It, didn't, it got me in it somehow. Why does it get me in it all the time? Uh, screenshot. Ah, it's because I didn't, I, I jumped into the scene too early. Okay, so let's save this. I'm gonna, we're gonna stick it right on our project page together. So you don't have to wait on me uh, uploading a surf, I'm not very good at that yet. Uh, um, uh, basic sort dot BNG. Okay. So I'm going to put this under suggested steps. Um, so here's H3. So now if we come, here, move, share, I said move, 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 that's not moving. Okay, now if we come into here and jump down to suggest, there it is, cool. Okay, so now you've got that as a screenshot with a little bit of my left arm. Um, all right. So we're gonna shift gears, we've got 20 minutes for Git, 24, yes, 20 minutes. All right. Um, Please grab your digital hands and raise them if you made a GitHub account. GitHub.com account. Okay, about half of you.
trickling. Yeah, a good, a good half. Okay, so we need, uh, that's part of our to-do list now. So I added this in our uh, week, our week to-do here. So what I did was, I think I showed you this before, but this is, uh, this is the page. Uh, I even have an hour and a half video of me explaining Git. Um, and I wanna give you an overview one more time of, of what we're doing. So there are several pieces to this and I want you to see how they work. So what I want you to do by Wednesday for sure is set up your account on the Microsoft Corporation's github.com, they bought it. So, uh, and once again, like I said before, don't make a new account. Uh, if you have one, just make a repository uh, public. If you are not the sharing type, you can pay seven bucks a month and have it be private. Um, and so, you're going to make a new repository, which we can then use to um, share things. And what's cool is, like we've said before, repo.it is wired up to put this in a Git repo. In fact, I can come here and say, I actually want you to put in what's in my repo into the account that I'm about to tell you. Um, so all of this links up together and hopefully will seem like a nice, um, a seamless development environment, which I think will be useful. Um, so I want to give you a little overview. I'm going to erase my stuff on the right. Okay. Get. So once again, like I've said in the past, uh, Git for me has been a journey of years. Um, and I encourage you to think of maybe like that. I encourage you to think of the Git learning as something that will take place in stages. And the first stage is to think about a GitHub repository as a fancy cloud drive that whenever you save in that cloud drive that the status of all the files in there gets a name and that name is called a commit with a commit message so we're gonna we're gonna build your uh, tool chain systematically in two parts so again github.com is a network based place in which we can store our repositories or repos for short okay and so inside github.com github.com gets a weird looking box inside there the git hub.com servers run the git for server software and what that does is manages um, pathways little pipelines for git repository information to flow through so into and out of github.com we can pass requests for changes to uh, git repo changes or as they call them deltas um, so what i'm having you do is make an account so that you can have a repository that is attached that you have permission to write to but by default everyone on the planet with an internet connection can access okay so you don't have to worry about setting up git for the server you just have to make an account on the system and they'll let you talk to your account using the web interface or what we want to get to eventually is 
your personal computer. So, hang on. Are you dead? The next phase is so what you're posting, um, what you're getting when you make a repository, as you get a URL um, that is universal by definition, universal resource locator that allows you to get to uh, anyone to get to your repo uh, online. I think that's okay, right? Okay. So um, what we're going to do next, uh, starting on Monday. Or probably Wednesday. Hang on one sec. Is we need to get your client set up to talk to the github.com account. So here's your local system. So local computer. And a git repository, local computer. And on this, you're going to install a tool that's just Git. So Git software will run uh, on your local computer. Um, and I have that link. That's the second link posted in the schedule, which is download Git for your system. So you'll notice you can go ahead and do that. Um, what I'm going to ask for is if there's a volunteer today, uh, that does not, that's running Microsoft Corporation's Windows, that would be willing to set it up while we screenshot it. Because unlike installing most things on your computer, the Git tool is designed to integrate with your system in several ways. And so the download is simple. You're just going to grab it for your operating system. But the configuration uh, has a couple of steps that will ask you questions that you may not know the answer to. Um, and so I, I'd like to try to video record that and post it. So if someone wants to stick around that um, has Windows, we could do that live, then I'll post it for Wednesday. So you're going to download Git. What Git does is it allows you to interact with your repository on your local system. And one of the things that it will let you do is, is connect up to one of the uh, ports that's open on the server and send those changes to and from your repo on your local system. Um, and so the definition of a repo on your local system, anyone remember that's been in my classes? How do you know if it's a Git repo? Contains what? Dot Git. Yeah, who said it? Was that Ben? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the hidden folder dot git hidden directory if you're in a directory or a subdirectory of any directory that has a dot git directory that was correctly made by the git tool that means that the git software knows how to manage the files inside of your inside of that directory and help you create a uh, a version network or a um it's actually a tree called the index where you can put your committed files uh, and you can think about this as like the vault so what's cool about git is it will allow us to stamp all the files in your local directory as this state i want to be able to go back to using name x and so the workflow that we'll learn how to do on your local computer is how do we make changes to files in that directory and then use the Git tool to prepare them for storage in the vault, which we call staging, um, and then store them in the vault, which we call committing. Um, and this is a mini version of the diagram that's really big and it's in the video at the top of that Git uh, Git guide. Um, and so, like I think I demonstrated to you last Wednesday, 
if you are applying for a software job, they will ask you about version control. Uh, I would bet the farm on that. And so beginning that journey, if you haven't already, uh, now is the time. Seize the time. Seize the day now. Um, and so step one, set up your github.com account. Step two is download and configure Git on your local system. And I'm going to uh, encourage us to use the, uh, the Git bash interface on Microsoft Windows systems and not the GUIs, the graphic user interfaces. Um, if you get employed in an organization, chances are they will have some graphic user interface tool that is giving commands to Git on your behalf. And those are useful because they're quick. And someone, all, someone has to tell you what to do is click this button and then click this button. Don't click that button. And if this happens, then click this other button. Um, I'm not training you to be click masters. I'm training you to be uh, tool builders. And so I want you to get familiar with the command line version of Git because it will teach you how to make sure that whatever GUI tool you use in the future is in fact operating correctly and will allow you to interact with any tool that has Git on it and not just people that have happened to install the GUI that you're familiar with. And so I want you uh, to be able to walk into a job interview or an internship or talk with other coders and say, uh, if you give me a headless server that doesn't have a screen attached to it and it's just a console, I can manipulate and move around files of file structures of arbitrary complexity uh, without without mistakes. Um, so once we get both of these installed, then we'll start learning how to use it to short store and share our C++ code together. Um, for some people, this is a big learning curve uh, because. It will involve learning how to use the born again shell, which is what we use in your repo. So the thing that you see on in your repo is bash. And in fact, let's try this. I haven't actually tried this. Um, let's see what it does. I have a feeling that it'll actually give us Git. Um, yep, so Git is already built in. So this is kind of cool because in reality, you don't even need to install Git locally if you don't want to, um, because it's already not a Git repository. Yeah, so we can actually start doing this right away. I wonder if, can I clone down I grab my Java stuff. This is cool. Let's try to grab this Raspberry Pi library. So here's our github.com. What I think I might be able to just clone this down. Yay, look, it works. Okay, so, um, you know, actually, we'll, we will uh, we'll just start working with this on, online because that means it'll be a unified interface. So just set up your github.com account and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, sorry, I didn't check that earlier. Uh, so, is that all that was in it? We dump everything out. We did dump everything out. Um, okay, so we're, we're up and going. This is cool. Uh, what is the time? Okay, we got five minutes. Um, and let me make a, before we go, let's add a column for your Git repos. Yeah. 
So this is going to be on, um, let's change the name to this to uh, DS repo git uh, mapping. All right, so we'll add a column here. Why are you being fussy? What's wrong with you? Why not? Maybe I don't have edit access. Any questions while I'm getting this set up? questions. Ah, good, it was a permission thing. Okay, so this is going to be your uh, github.com repository URL. So in my case, I'm going to come here to my git, and I'm going to say, Um, if you want to, if you already have your account, you could join me. Technology rediscovery. I'm going to say new. I call it. Uh, no, it's CIT two four five. Look at that. Oh, look, Microsoft is doing it. They defaulted to public. I knew they would do it. We all knew it was coming. Okay. Private is actually free now. It's what? Private is actually free now. Oh. Okay. And the other thing I want you to think carefully about is what license. Um, in, my, in my guide, I, I ask you to spend a few minutes uh, thinking about licenses. And I, I am a GPL version 3. But take some time and figure out what the right license is for you. So once you've made a, um, a repo, this is the page, this is the URL that will get you in there. And so that's what I'm going to stick right there. Okay. So if you can have that set up for Wednesday, we'll start using Git and repo uh, and we'll be off to the races. All right, sweet deal. We have a minute and six seconds. And uh, have fun with your algos. This is cool. Anything from anyone? I'll stick around for office hours if you have questions. Otherwise, make sure you send your attendance in. And have a nice uh, couple days. Hi, Eric. I followed this um, YouTuber who's like into linguists into linguistics and computer science. His name uh -huh. is Tom Scott. Have you heard of him? No, I don't do, no. I don't follow much on the internet. No. Oh. He makes really good videos on like computer concepts. And I found this really great visualization on binary search. I know it's not necessarily sorting. But oh, neat. Yes, search I'll is next. I'll it to uh, the chat and then you can check it out and maybe we can watch it uh, if we get to that point in class. Yes, we, we, we shall, absolutely. Tom uh, Scott is great. Cool.
What language does he work in, Rusty? He does like a bunch of stuff. Um, he tries to generalize it, I think, but uh, I think he's like very fluent in most stuff. But yeah, he tries to like generalize concepts. Cool. Yeah, cool. Search and sort. Looks like they're nice, quick little videos. Where is he coming from? What do you mean? Do you know where he is? Uh, he's in like this, he's based in the UK. He's like in a uh, computer science uh, museum or like computer information center or something like oh, that. Great. Cool. Yeah. And he's got a website. That's neat. Well, before I forget, let me, um, let's put that under external resources. We can get I'm back. pretty sure he doesn't. He doesn't work there. They just let him film there. Yeah. Sorry, one more time. I'm pretty sure he doesn't work there. They just let him film there. Ah, okay. Um, All right, I gotta run. Have a nice day. Hey, thanks. See ya. Questions? Anyone lurking out there? And the name of this YouTuber is uh, Tom Scott. All right, good. We've got that up there. All right, how's it going out there? Anyone, anyone, Caesar? How's stuff going, Casey? Pretty good. Good. You got your your objects, your socks. Are you successful with your socks? Uh, I think so. Now I got to figure out this uh, sorter stuff. Yes. Yes, indeed. So start simple, simple as you possibly can. That's the way to go. Hang on, I'm trying to up my volume just a little bit. Oh, that's why it was way low. Okay. Um, she's a, do you need any help or anyone need any help? Uh, I had a question. Yeah. I just had a quick question. So, like, if we were to, like, say we just needed any type of general information uh, regarding C++, um, where would your, like, first recommendation be? Like, is there a specific, like, you know, link or website or? Uh, the book. And the, the book that I recommend is the best. Um, I, I strategically am not a, uh, I'm not a YouTube, I post a lot on YouTube, but I, I don't myself consume a lot of video tutorials. Um, and so I, I learned mostly from the book. Do you have a copy of the stress trip book? Yeah, I got, I got the one you recommended. It, it definitely helps. Like it, it like explains it in a way where it's not too, you know, just too much at once. Yeah, my suggestion with using the book is find the sections uh, that are relevant for our class that we talk about um, and then code with the author, but don't just type in what's in the book. Change the variable names to ones that are customized to you. Uh, and what that's going to do is uh, require that your brain is not just copying from the book, but rather thinking about how each of the parts that Strostrup uses make it into your program. Um, okay. And I, I was trying to get my dot cam working, and a half hour later I didn't. Otherwise, I would, I would show you. But I would say the the place to start would be the middle the middle chapters called um, your first program, and I believe it's chapters seven, uh, six and seven. Uh, are really good because he 
he's building a whole program from thinking through the end. So basically, I think you could do six, seven, eight, and nine, and that would be almost all of the C++ that you'd need for this class. Um, okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. And let me know how it's going. And if you find resources, we can also ask for general from the class next time. Maybe I can have a, a sheet in that spreadsheet for people to post important online resources because sometimes the book may not be ideal for you. So um, I appreciate you asking. Of course.